Welcome to I on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Today we tap into innovations in technology improving lives across our nation. We learn money saving tips to keep energy costs low along with a Connecticut homeowner. And we head to Microsoft's headquarters in Washington state for a peek at the very near future of artificial intelligence. But first, a new study from the University of Texas explores what happens when humans and robots coexist. Omar Villafranca met the researchers looking at how programmable robots interact with non-programmable humans. When they walk around campus, all the attention is on them. Oh my God, I'm on campus with a dog. They're on four legs or four wheels. The robots roaming the campus at the University of Texas at Austin are part of a groundbreaking science and social experiment deep in the heart of Texas's robotics program. Social scientist Carrie Stevens and engineer Luis Sentis are both working on the project. You want to see how these programmable robots are interacting with non-programmable humans, basically. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The spin that we're giving here is that we're not so much interested in, in a one-to-one -one interaction with that particular human. We're interested, interested in the interaction with the community. For now, the first assignment is to stroll through busy walkways, delivering sanitizer and wipes. Soon, they may be able to communicate, giving directions and even tours. But researchers won't just be watching the robots. Are you going to be watching more the robots? or the people. We're going to watch both. And then that gives us a lot of feedback with how we might need to adjust the robots to make people more comfortable around them. Comfort is the key word. With the help of special cameras, the study will look at every reaction the people have, from body language and facial expressions to how they walk around the machines. What would a robot be like on a day-to-day -day basis if you're interacting with it every day? And that robot needs to be convenient to be around. Justin Hart is a UT computer science professor, and today he's in control of Spot, the largest and easily the most popular of the robots. Hi. Just taking Spot for a stroll garners the attention and data that scientists hope will make this five-year study a success. As robotics and artificial intelligence become more involved in our everyday lives. Moving these things into the wild, I expect to make lots and lots of discoveries about how people actually accomplish things and how to make these interfaces actually work. A step towards the future, four legs at a time. Now to the East Coast, where the cost to keep warm is rising. Home heating prices are at a 10-year high, up nearly 36% from last winter. Nancy Chen visits with a Connecticut couple to learn some money-saving tips. The oil bill, it went up $160. Per month. Per month. Bob Duncan and his wife Allison recently retired, but as their energy bills have spiked, the Connecticut couple has had to re-budget their spending and 401k. What do you do in that situation? We call up our money manager and ask for more money. They also called Chris Villanueva, a house technician who audits energy use. He says air escaping through window and door cracks alone can cost homeowners hundreds of dollars a year. What are you testing here? So we're testing here the air leakage from the house to hopefully help keep the warm air in the winter. Now that you have this going, where do you go next? Now we just walk through the house, check every room and see what uh, air leaks we find. Great, let's do it. Plugging leaky windows and doors and even interior door frames can prevent heating systems from running excessively. You can put your hand to it and actually oh. feel the air coming in. Oh, I do. Villanueva also recommends setting the thermostat between 65 and 68 degrees, switching to LED light bulbs and improving insulation. But some other energy draining culprits may not be as obvious known as energy vampires, they could account for up to 20% of your electric bill. We always encourage homeowners to unplug anything that's not being used. 75% of appliance energy use comes from when they're off, including this coffee maker. When I hear Bob talk about how much yeah. his energy bill goes up, it makes it feel like you have no power as a yeah. homeowner, but this makes it feel like there are little things that you can do. Yeah, there's definitely little things that he can do to help improve it tips to keep the heat in your home and off your wallet this winter. 
After the break, skin cancer awareness for those who frequent nail salons. This is Eye on America. Welcome back. The gel manicure is a popular service for beauty routines, but a recent study found that UV nail dryers used to cure or harten gel nail polish causes mutations typically seen in skin cancer. Anna Werner investigates the health concerns and how to take precautions. Before Carolina Jasko won the Miss Illinois contest in 2018, getting gel manicures had been part of her beauty routine all through high school. So I would get my nails done pretty frequently. A gel manicure uses special compounds to create a harder, long-lasting nail cover. It requires the use of a dryer that uses ultraviolet light to harden or cure the gel nails. Just having like that regular... Um, like nail polish it isn't going to be enough. It might not last as long as you want. It might not look as nice as you want. It was during one of her frequent manicures that the salon's technician noticed a dark line under her thumbnail. And I remember my nail tech looking at me and he was like, oh, what happened? And I was like, oh, is it a bruise? Like, did you hit yourself or slam your hand? And I was like, maybe, like I must have, you know, I didn't even think about it. But a week later, she was in pain and her nail looked infected. And when she saw the doctor, you have to have a biopsy right away because it doesn't look good. Jasko says on her 18th birthday, she received her biopsy results. Melanoma, the most serious kind of skin cancer, which if it spreads can be deadly. A rare form known as acral melanoma. I just remember like feeling like numb. Like I honestly didn't really feel anything. Jasko underwent multiple surgeries. Doctors removed her thumbnail and grafted skin from her groin to replace the missing skin on her thumb. The cause? Impossible to say for sure. But Jasko says her doctors suspected genetics because her mother had had melanoma, but also her use of those UV nail dryers. For me, it was very confusing at that time where I was like, oh my gosh, I've been so careful. You know, I've never been in a tanning bed. Like I always wear sunscreen and I felt so young and it was confusing. Her case made headlines and prompted researchers at the University of California, San Diego to study the potential hazards of those UV dryers. Researcher Maria Zavagi. That kind of was one of our uh, motivation or inspiration because there was a potential link uh, between these machines and cancer. What they call a first-of-its-kind study found those UV dryers do, in fact, damage cells and cause mutations typically seen in skin cancer. In the laboratory cells they analyzed, after one 20-minute session of exposure to the UV dryers, it resulted in 20 to 30 percent of cells dying, while three consecutive 20-minute sessions of exposure resulted in 65 to 70 percent of cells dying. When we see cell death, it means that there has been a huge amount of damage to the cell that led it to die. The Food and Drug Administration told us it's reviewing the study's findings, but its current advice is that it views nail curing lamps as low risk when used as directed. The Trade Association for the UV and Electron Beam Industry, RADTEC, said that all scientific evidence demonstrates that UV nail lamps are safe when used according to well-established safe practices. But the results of the study made Zavagi stop her own gel manicures. I did not want to expose myself to more uh, cancer risk factors. Cleveland Clinic dermatologist Melissa Pillion. If you had your way, would you have patients not use these at all? I think it's best to not use these at all because we know that they can cause cancer. What we don't know yet is how much, how many times you have to use it, how frequently you have to use it to increase your risk. Some of that we won't know until people have been using these machines for 20 or 30 years, at which point it will be too late. Jasko's cancer was fully removed, but she has since advocated for skin cancer awareness and knows she's lucky hers was caught early. So it's like right now I don't have my thumbnail, but I could have lost my thumb. I could have lost my hand. It could have been so much worse. One thing she didn't know, that she was the inspiration behind the study. It does make me emotional because I can't believe that my story would like make that much of an impact on someone or be like that important. So it's really cool. That really is making you emotional. Yeah, I know. I'm like, I didn't even expect that. Yeah. But yeah, it's really cool. It makes me feel like, wow, like this was important and this is important. We continue the conversation on health with a potential game changer in treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. 
Veterans are more likely to have PTSD than civilians, with seven out of every 100 veterans suffering from PTSD. Our Dr. Jonathan LaPook finds out why some doctors are now recommending psychedelic drugs as a new therapy. Devastated by PTSD, in 2006, Jonathan Lubecki tried to take his own life. I put a loaded 9mm to my temple and I pulled the trigger. That was the first suicide attempt that I had. I've had a total of five. After his last attempt in 2013, the Iraq war veteran began participating in a clinical trial of MDMA, the active ingredient in ecstasy, during sessions with specially trained therapists. I don't know, I feel normal again, if that makes any sense. My world changed. This therapy is the sole reason that my son has a father instead of a folded flag. Lubecki says he's now living a life free from PTSD. MDMA mutes the amygdala, which is your, your fight or flight response. Your emotions stay in this happy medium range that they need to be in for the therapy to work. Research organization MAPS PBC first began clinical trials of MDMA in 2003. It announced the findings of its latest trials. 88% of the people had clinically significant decrease in their PTSD symptoms. 67% of them lost their PTSD diagnosis. MAPS PBC plans to submit its results for publication and, later this year, ask the FDA to approve MDMA as a prescription medication in combination with therapy. So if somebody says to you, you're talking about ecstasy, a recreational drug, what would you say? It's being administered in a very particular manner by people that are quite well trained. We are not suggesting that anyone try this on their own at home in their living room. No flashbacks, no panic attacks, no anxiety. Lubecki is finishing his third humanitarian aid mission to Ukraine. Everyone said PTSD can't be cured. I'm living proof that that isn't true. Coming up, we look at new technology from Microsoft, a powerful search engine you can chat with. That story's next. We close our show with a breakthrough in artificial intelligence. Microsoft is reinventing the way we browse and use the internet with what they call a co-pilot. Tony DeCopel sits down with the CEO to talk about the future of artificial intelligence and how it could impact lives. We come to Microsoft to see what all the talk is about, this new technology that could apparently reinvent the way you use the web. What are we looking at? We are looking at the brand new Bing. And with a little help from Divya Kumar, a Bing marketing executive, we see this really is something different. It's looking across the web, pulling in the collective knowledge that it has, and it's synthesizing and distilling the answer. Along with the usual search results, we also get a summary written by Microsoft's new AI-powered Bing. Can we ask it a follow-up question? Absolutely. And in a new feature simply called chat, the system turns even complex questions into conversational answers. Look at that. Wow. A complete multi-part so personalized calculation of my gas uh, cost, for example, for a family road trip. That's amazing. And Microsoft is building chat into its Edge browser as well, offering users a tool that can summarize and even analyze something as complex as a warranty for a major appliance. It says, I'm sorry to hear that your washer is not working. Unfortunately, using dish soap in your washer may not be covered under the warranty as it can be considered misuse or abuse of the product, which it definitely would be. And I'm going to do generate. It's a kind of co-pilot, as Microsoft puts it, something that can help you write. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, honestly, it's at the level of a lot of food magazines. Or even launch a full job search, finding companies that are hiring. Dear hiring manager. And writing the cover letter, too. It's a great starting point. Hello. Hi, Tony. How are you? It's great, great to, to meet you. you. For Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella, it's all a generational chance to put his company back on top when it comes to innovation. We clearly are in a kind of arms race when it comes to AI. It seems like everybody is coming out with new products this year. Where is this going? Well, as you said, it's a new race. And, and it's a new race in the most important software category or the largest software category in search. Uh, let's face it. Uh, Google dominates it. We are thrilled to be here launching Bing to compete. Microsoft developed the technology in partnership with OpenAI, the creators of the viral sensation ChatGPT. 
But while the new Bing is much more powerful than its predecessor, it's also far from perfect. That didn't work. We notice at times it can be slow and unresponsive. And on at least two occasions, it seems to not only get things wrong, but like make that. things up. But this one's a little bit weird. North Carolina's in the wrong direction. First, it suggests to stop in Dunn, North Carolina, 500 miles out of our way when we ask for guidance on a drive from New York to Cape Cod. We tell Bing that doesn't work. Oops, you're right. I'm sorry for the mistake. I meant to say Dunn, Connecticut. And that's actually really valuable feedback. Look at that. Chat. Amazing. Or okay. so it seemed until we later discovered that the restaurant definitely isn't in Dunn, Connecticut because Dunn, Connecticut does not exist. And we are amazed at how quickly it suggests a job for a plumber in Charlottesville, Virginia. Dutton plumbing, 45 bucks an hour sounds pretty great. But once again, we later find no record of any Dutton plumbing in the area. Can we ask it, can I trust you? In fact, as the bot readily admits, this generation of AI is not yet to be trusted. I sometimes make mistakes, it warns us. Double check the facts. Is this ready? Are you confident for wide release? Um, you know, look, the, the only way for any new technology it, to be really perfected is to be in the market with real human feedback. If anything, is, in particular with AI, it has to get aligned with human preferences, both personally and societally, in terms of the norms. And that's why we want to launch it, we want to have all the safety, we want to have all of the things that will make sure uh, that no harms are created, but we need it out there in the real world. We had hoped to test how the new search handles the risk of misinformation and bias, but that's when an off-camera executive stepped in. I would say that's probably not the best thing in our beta that we're running today. He asked us to leave the entire topic of guardrails to their CEO, who told us the model had been trained with safety as a top priority. So if you ask it to help you do something illegal, what are you saying? It will not respond? It will not. And, and if it does, we will immediately do takedown. Another concern is, is bias. How can you even begin to control or police that in chat? Well, I mean, it's the same thing again. And today, when you search on the web, you get what's available on the web. You know, this is where human agency is at a premium. Uh, you will always be able to trip any new AI model uh, because you prompted it. So the, I think we should start with the responsibility each of us as users have to take. And yes, we will have many, many mechanisms to ensure that nothing biased, nothing harmful gets generated. And then I have to ask, and I sound a little bit silly, I feel a little bit silly even contemplating it, but some very smart people ranging from Elon Musk to Sam Altman, who I just saw in the hallway here, your partner at OpenAI, have raised the specter of AI somehow going wrong in a way that is lights out for humanity. You're nodding your head, you've heard this too. Yeah. Is that a real concern? And if it is, what are we doing? Look, I mean, look, runaway AI is, if it happens, it's a real problem. And so the way to sort of deal with that is to make sure it never runs away. And so that's why I look at it and say, so let's start with, before we even talk about alignment and safety and all of these things that one should do with AI, let's talk about the context in which AI is used. I think about like the first set of categories in which we should use these powerful models are where humans unambiguously, unquestionably are in charge. And so as long as we sort of start there, characterize these models, make these models more safe, and over time much more explainable, then we can think about other forms of usage. But let's not have it run away. The car of humanity is at a crossroads. To the left is dystopia, to the right is utopia. The blinker is on. Which way is it pointing? It's utopia. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching. I on America.